how's your sex life? How's your wieners, your vajayjays, all the things that you use when you're having sex? And the reason I ask is because no one else does. And that's why you're here listening to the Sex 101 podcast. It's hard to communicate your sexual desires, your needs, your wants. So we're here for you and your partner. This show is dedicated to improving sexual communication and removing the taboos about sex and sexual intimacy. Dr. Stormy has a wealth of experience, knowledge, and helpful advice that will take your lovemaking to the next level. And I'm here to make you laugh and show you that even rock stars don't know enough about sex. So put on your headphones if you're at work and let us make sex better for you. All right, we're back with another Sex 101 podcast. How are you doing, Stormy? Doing well. Thank you, Toby. I'm doing a little better. I had a, uh, it's been so busy. I've been taking over my van's uh, shipping and the van that I used broke down in Asheville, North Carolina. And oh, no. and, and it, it's funny because of this podcast and everything it made me, I just couldn't stop thinking because the whole thing relied on a nipple. <laughs> <laughs> my car broke Wait, down what? because of a nipple. And here's what it is. There's a little rubber nipple cap that fits over <laughs> this part in the, on the radiator that it was torn uh -huh. and leaking coolant. And I was like, of course, a nipple would cause me all the issues in the world. You know, total the power of the nipple, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, while I was sitting there on the side of the road figuring that out, eventually I got it figured out and I'm back home. Thank goodness. Um, I was looking up stuff for this podcast and I came across a stat that kind of I was like, oh, this is interesting. It says that people that like rock music are more likely to be unfaithful. <laughs> oh my god! I'm in a rock band. I was like, oh my goodness. I said a study conducted among the British uh, said that 42% of people that cheated liked rock music, while people that liked rap was only 2%. Gospel was 3%. Classical was 7%, more than both. Wow. Are, but those are the least likely to cheat. So if you like rap, gospel, or classical music, but fortunately I like both ah. of those, but you know, I'm a, I'm a rock musician, but oh I, uh, my gosh. I was thinking about this this episode. We want to talk about fidelity and monogamy and relationships, and uh, we want to delve into that, which is you know kind of can be a tricky situation because a lot of people, you know, the stats definitely people do cheat. They do yeah, cheat. I mean, like like you get in a relationship, there is there's a common. significant percentage that you, that you can cheat, and it's not only if you like rock music. I'll let you know because you know, <laughs> while I was married, I never cheated on my wife. That I'm a, I'm the kind of person that uh, is so in my head that I would just be thinking about. I couldn't even enjoy the sex because I'd be thinking too much about, oh, I'm going to live with this or will they, you know, will my partner know, uh, you know, I just can't go there. Totally. I, yeah. I think, I'm a Catholic in recovery. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm a Catholic. I, I grew up Catholic. And so guilt, I'm really good at guilt. So for me, uh, fidelity so and guilt. guilt, I am like, I'm like overly good at guilt, you yeah. know, so that would just be not sexy for me. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a great subject to talk about, right? We talk on this podcast all the time about the importance of communication. Um, and so these are, this is a touchy subject. Um, and, you know, and I was, I was kind of, as I was, I was preparing for this pod, I was talking to my partner, my boyfriend, and, and you know, he was like, Stormy, people don't have these conversations, but if they did it'd be so, so, so helpful. And so this is our, you know, this podcast is about having hard conversations, being armed with en information education and so and giving you guys some tools to have these hard conversations. So I think it's an awesome, I'm really excited to dive into this uh, and do so with, with education, information and, and compassion today. Yeah, 100%. So you got a place you want to start? Where do you, where do you... Well, you know, I think it's like 15, you know, if you look at the statistics, I always go with like the research, right? So 15 to 50 percent, it's big range, but of di divorces are report infidelity as the cause, right? And the American Psychological Association says 20 to 40 percent of divorces are caused uh, by infidelity. So it's such a common cause for for the deterioration of, of a marriage and of a relationship. Um, and I can say, you know, personally, I've been through it. I have had multiple partners in my past that that cheated on me. And it is it is messy. It is painful. It is sticky. It is tricky. Um, you know, and, and it's just it's so common that we want it when we when you and I were talking, we're like, how can we not address this? And it also very much plays into sex and sexuality, right? Because when you're cheating, you are having sexual relations with someone else outside of your monogamous partnership. So, um, you know, the common and it's one of the top reasons cited for divorce, you know, uh, just anecdotally. What's an interesting statistic I came across, though, was 
and again about the power of communication is secret infidelity. Five years later, this is one study, only 20% of people were still married. So if it's not disclosed, revealed infidelity, 57% of people were still married five years later. Wow. And so, yeah, isn't that, wasn't that interesting? I thought that yeah. was a really interesting research study. So, and then one of my favorite things about fidelity that I, and I can't remember who said it, but I love to, to, to quote it, um, is that you're not looking for a, a different person when you're cheating. You're looking for a different you. Mm. And I really like that, right? So how you feel maybe in the arms or in the bed of someone else that you're cheating with. Um, it really brings out a, a, you, you might not be feeling that way in your partnership, but you can by communication and by working on these things, you can feel that way in your partnership, or you can, you know, you also have conscious choice. You can also choose to end your partnership. That is a choice that we all have at all times, right? We are autonomous yeah. human beings. I would say with the blessing or the curse of free will, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's interesting. You're yeah. Well, People, what are they looking for? Because it seems like the answer would be s simple, like, uh, you know, just being a guy. Well, you just get some sex or something like that. But mm -hmm. that, that doesn't seem to always be the case, really. I mean, obviously, that, that fantasy or that idea of a one night stand or being with another person, I'm sure that that, that has an appeal and are, is a reason why people do cheat. But a lot of times you're right. I guess you are looking for something about you. you you're, you're missing something and you you really just need uh, another, is, is there another person that could fill that void that you have in your relationship? Right. Exactly. Right. And I mean, I think kind of, you know, if you, our biology is non-monogamous, right. We, we are, we cultural constructs, social constructs, religious contracts promote monogamy, um, in our country still as like the main paradigm for a relation for relating, but our biology is non-monogamous. <laughs> so we, you know, that's one of the things like I was, and as I was thinking about what I want to share, and what we wanted to kind of dive into today, like besides just kind of bringing some awareness to infidelity is that it is a choice, right? And so one of the things that I really love is the term conscious monogamy or awakened monogamy. And that's a term, uh, awakened monogamy is coined by Robert Masters, who I love. He wrote uh, the book, Transformation Through Intimacy, super awesome book. Mm. For any of you out there who are into books, it's also on Audible. Um, but, you know, the idea is that through full choice, full conscious choice that you're choosing monogamy together, if that's your choice, right? There, there are many relationship paradigms. Monogamy is one of them, but conscious monogamy rather than default monogamy. And for me, I can just tell you my own personal journey. When I came across that maybe like seven or eight years ago, read that book and came across that term and his and Robert Masters work, I was like, what the hell? This is amazing. This is what we need to be practicing if we're choosing monogamy. Yeah. So rather than you know, perfunctory or default monogamy, conscious monogamy, awakened monogamy, meaning that you're full, again, the fully autonomous human being who's choosing to be monogamous with the person that you're with. Um, and I, I can say I'm a serial monogamous. Like I'm just wired to be monogamous. Like that is that for me, I have, and I've tried different relationship paradigms. Um, for me, my greatest growth and my greatest love and my greatest surrender and my greatest sex happens when I'm practicing monogamy. And that's my choice, right? So, yeah. um, and when I was out there dating, I was like, hey, this is what I choose. Like, if this doesn't work for you, like we can, you know, that's fine. Um, but the, but it was really this idea of choosing monogamy rather than just defaulting into monogamy really changed it for me. And so I, rec I encourage you to go out there and, and learn about conscious monogamy or awakened monogamy. If, if you're practicing, you can already do this. Even if you're like married and practicing monogamy and been practicing default monogamy, you can switch into being more about conscious monogamy and being fully in choice about monogamy. I like that. I've actually never heard that before. So default monogamy is just, you go, well, that's just the way it is. And I'm just going to accept it. Right. You know, you're not making any decision. You just go, well, that's just, that's just how it is. That's kind of the way the church yep. taught me. Like totally. you're, you're just supposed to be monogamous, you know, don't totally. even, don't even think of yep. anything else. And I like that idea. You're talking about conscious monogamy because then you have some ownership of it and you go, I, I am choosing this. It's not, uh, this isn't against my will or just how th that's the breaks, you know, that, that you know, exactly. this is actually something I want to do. And that actually is so much more powerful and, and exciting, I guess, for that relationship. Right. And, right. and rather than a loss of freedom, right? Because there is many people will experience monogamy as a loss of freedom, right? Like a loss of sexual freedom, for example. Yeah. But you, to your point, it's not, it's like just expected. 
And okay, by the way, not only is it expected, but don't talk about it. Don't ever talk about it. It's just, it's just what you're going to ascribe to. And we know that 20 to 50% of the time, it isn't the case. It isn't what's real for people, you know? And so instead you're, you're saying, Hey, we are actually biologically, like our biology is non-monogamous, like, right. And so, and we're choosing monogamy together. And what does that mean? for us as our partnership. Because if you have 20 monogamous partnerships in the room, you have 20 different definitions of monogamy and of what faithful is and what cheating is, right? And that kind of brings me to to the next piece, which is have these conversations about it. Like, so one of the reasons that I believe in, in, in my studies and also with my clients and in my own journey that so many people quote unquote cheat is because there's no conversation about what's cheating. Like, it's mm. like, it's kind of like communication 101, you know, so I can share with like, when I was first dating my partner, he, I was like, well, let's have a conversation. Like, what's cheating? And, he, you know, of course he's like, oh boy, like, uh, can I have a beer for this conversation? <laughs> you know? But it was like, well, it's, isn't that obvious? And I was like, no, it's so far from obvious. What do you define as cheating? So that's like a great, even if you are in a long-term committed monogamous already partnership, I really encourage you get connected, go out, have a sweet, don't, this is not like a, in the bedroom conversation, but when you're really feeling connected of like, what does that mean to you? Even if you've been practicing monogamy with your partner for a long time. Okay. And these are not easy conversations. These are hard, intimate, yeah. powerful conversations, but what does monogamy mean to you? What does cheating mean to you? Those two questions alone give you so much information about where your partner is and is not. And then you guys, and then you come to like, you're both adults, fully autonomous human beings. And then you get to clarify your agreements, right? You get to, you get to say, this is what we're both agreeing to. Yeah. And then, then you're, then it's fully up that, you know, then it's up to you to, to ascribe to those agreements. Yeah. I think you're right. It's, it's funny how sometimes the simplest conversation that you need to have, like, you feel like you need a beer to, to have it, even though it, that, that should be it. It's just because so much is tied up with it and you don't want to say the wrong thing. And you're, you're like, it, it's, it's funny having this conversation because if, especially early on in the relationships, you don't know what the other person is really going to say. And so you don't want your feelings hurt or you don't want to hurt their feelings either. You don't want to go, I'm open to anything or I'm not open to, or I'm not open to anything. That's a, that totally. can be a tougher conversation, but it it is a simple conversation. This is what I think cheating is. That really right. shouldn't be so hard, and, but people really avoid it. They really avoid it. Oh, absolutely. The, that, that right? Or like, or my partner, like, and he meant it so kindly. He's like, well, isn't that just obvious? And I was like, no, it's like so far from obvious. And as we got into the conversation, you, to your point, Toby, you realize the different nuances, right? And there's so many different kinds of cheating. You know, research would say there's seven kinds of cheating. Did you, did you know that? There were seven oh. kinds of cheating. <laughs> okay, so there's physical yeah. Emotional, right? Those are pretty right. obvious. There's financial. There's object infidelity. So that like might be your phone or like golf Ooh. or like, like if, if you prioritize an object over the relationship and it in, in negatively impacts the relationship, that could wow. be. Wow. Yeah, I have not heard that, that one. That I've not heard that one. And from all the men I've talked to, that is I've never thought about that as cheating, but you're right. The idea of how important that object, your even like your phone. I mean, totally that, right so, like, yeah i haven't heard that one and they the experience of that other person can feel a lot like a physical betrayal because it's like well i feel you know unseen unappreciated unheard unloved right the experience of when someone cheats so i thought that was an interesting one and then the other one that's really adds a layer of complexity and even more important why we have these conversations is cyber cheating right mm-hmm. it, it is it is at our fingertips. Our phone, they say our phones are never more than 12 inches, 12 yeah. to 20 inches from our person, which is crazy, but uh, true. And so we have, right. So for example, if you're in a partnership, is it, do you consider it cheating if your partner is, is sexy texting, cyber texting with someone he's never going to meet or she's never going to meet? Does that feel like cheating to you? There's no right or wrong to this, by the way. Yeah. There's your, what are your agreements in your partnership, Right. Um, for some that'd be like, mm, you know, no, I don't consider that cheating because they're never going to physically have contact. Right. So that person values physical connection as like the, as the limit, as the line. So, but for, for, for some that'd be like, no, that would feel, I would feel very betrayed if I'm partner sexting 
and first of all, we don't know if it's even a woman on the other end of the, right. of the, you know, receiving that. But I, you know, for me, that would feel like a betrayal because I'd rather have him sexy texting with me. Right? right. So that's, you know, again, you get to have that, that thing. So the cyber, uh, we mentioned financial, and then this is another one. Okay. And then the, this combined, right. Which is some combination. And this one for me, I had forgotten about, it was really interesting to read about. It's called micro cheating. Micro cheating. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Micro cheating. And basically how I describe it is it's towing the line. So let's say you do have a clear line with your partner and in most partnerships, we just were saying don't have clear lines, but let's say you do. And you know exactly where the line is, but you're going to tow right up, even on it a little bit and, but not hop all the way over it. That would be micro cheating. So let's say, for example, if your maybe stated or unstated agreement in a partnership is no sex with someone else, but you're like heavy flirting and even like a little heavy petting would not be, you know, the partner might tow all the way up to that line, but they're not going to have penetrative sex because that's the line. Right. right. So and I think micro cheating is subtle. I mean, and a lot of it, there's a, the frequency of micro cheating is really high, but you can't even know if you're micro cheating if you don't know where the lines are, if you don't know yeah. where the agreements are, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, for me, and this is, this is personal, but this is, you know, I want to like be vulnerable. I mean, we're talking about vulnerability all the time on this podcast. For me, my guy is always, could my partner appear in an instant? If I'm practicing monogamy, which I currently am, if my, could my partner appear in an instant and feel comfortable with reading the text or being there in the interaction or seeing what is going on? And if the answer is no, because I know my partner, then I then I'm probably towing the line. Right? Yeah. So like, could he read a text in my phone or anything like that? Right. So that's how I use my gauge for micro cheating. But again, that depends on you. That depends on your partnership. That depends on the the very explicit agreements that the two of you have come up with because you can't know if you're cheating if you don't know where the lines are. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've wondered that too. Like even the idea of, because you're right, our phones are so uh, almost attached to our hands now. Um, the right. idea of even like uh, a more than casual following of somebody on Instagram, even if it's not mm -hmm. like connecting with them or talking to them or maybe it's a comment just to hey your, your content's so great or whatever but if you're really following somebody on instagram a bunch you're right like if your partner showed up and saw you like how often you're looking at a page on instagram of somebody's photos or how closely mm -hmm. you're following mm -hmm. them or that i can see some of that for sure i've been in like talking about all of these i, I there was a time i can remember uh in my marriage where i was uh had worked closely with another person and I was like, Oh, this person's so cool. You know, and, and we, and our jobs are similar. And so we interact well together. We laugh mm -hmm. a lot, we're, you know, and now I, I was like, huh, I, it didn't go any farther, but I, but I actually, even that innocent, nothing happened. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. were just friends, mm -hmm. but I, if both of us had been single, we might would have gone right. on a date or something like that. And I, and I, so I was like, I probably should, make sure my barriers are good, healthy barriers. Not, not that, you know, they weren't doing anything. I wasn't doing anything, but just the amount of yeah. time that we're spending with each other and stuff. I was like, you know what? I got to make sure that I'm, this is a, a great friendship. And I, and cause totally. I do, cause I do think sometimes it's easy, like, especially with the emotional stuff. I think if your relationship at all is a little tough or you're going through a tougher time mm -hmm. or there's something you're not getting and somebody else just gives you that, it feels so It good. does. That if is somebody's, human nature. You know, really <laughs> laughing at your jokes or somebody's really yeah. listening and you don't have right. that or somebody's just even just not, you know, a, a little short with you or something that that right. feels so good. It it can. I mean, Absolutely. emotionally, it can feel as, just like that sexual uh, feeling of feels so good. If your emotions get met and your need, emotional needs get met, it feels so good. Yeah absolutely right and again that comes back to like you're not looking for a different person you're looking for a different you a different yeah. lived experience of you but it's a great example that you gave like let's say you're not maybe you're struggling in the realm of physical or sexual intimacy in your partnership and you're not having sex with someone else but there's someone of the opposite sex if, if you're hetero um, or same sex if you're not and they're giving you even just non-sexual physical touch you're going to be yeah. like Ooh, that feels so good because it does, right? Because you're yeah. not having that need met. So here's the deal where it goes into conscious monogamy. 
you would actually take that to your partner and say, I am really struggling with a lack of physical intimacy in our relationship. And I have found, and by the way, I have actually done this, this exact thing, like, and I am struggling, not in my current partnership and pre- and, and past partnerships, but you, I have said, I am actually really liking the attention or the affection from a male friend or a male colleague. And that that scares me. That that makes me feel sad. That makes me feel unsafe in our relationship. And I like you brought I brought that to them and we had a conversation about that. And it was a place for us to grow and to get closer together. Right. Yeah. Because the reality is we are going to be attracted to other people outside of our partnership. That is just how we are wired. And who like I say, who cares? The energy of attraction is just the energy of attraction. What matters is what do you do with it? Yeah. Like, what do you do with it? And to your point, like in a parallel universe with that person, there may, you may have dated that person, right? There's kind of parallel universe things of like, wow, this is, this would be a potential partner for me, but this is not where I am currently. Right. And so that's the conscious piece, right? That's the, that's the piece about being evolved, being thoughtful, being mindful and having the courage to take it to your partner to say, I'm really struggling with this. And this is what's happening for me. You literally, and you have to decide in your partnership, do you want to talk about attractions outside of the partnership? But that's yeah. something to talk about, right? And maybe it's, I don't want to know unless I need to know. I mean, whatever, there's so many different variations of it, but have these conversations because the reality is we are all sexual beings. We are, our biology is non-monogamous. I believe monogamy for me is a really powerful choice, for personal sexual and spiritual growth but not everyone does chooses that paradigm and so having these conversations even if you've been in a long-term partnership can be like incredibly powerful incredibly insightful and also really sexy af right like if you are in a monogamous partnership this is the one person on the planet you're choosing to have sex with and how special that is how sacred that is yeah 100 percent. i want to go back to that so interesting an object cheating like that is because <laughs> uh <laughs> It's funny that we, we're bringing this up because my girlfriend and I had a conversation. This has been on at least a month or so ago, but we're, uh, my band's playing in Hawaii and I've been wanting to get in better shape, but it's been like, I was doing so good. And then the holidays hit and you know, and then <laughs> I'm doing okay, but still not as good as I was. And now it's about uh-huh. to be May and I'm like, what is going on? And then, you know, and I'm like, I, I and, and, um, we'd had this conversation about what we thought cheating was and, and what, you know, what our relationship would be, you know? And, uh, but it was funny cause I went on a short little tour with my band and while I just didn't eat that good. And she was like, she says, this is interesting because she, you know, I know you and you wouldn't ever cheat, but it's interesting that you would let yourself do, you know, just eat poorly that, and you don't want to, you say you don't want to, but you're kind of cheating on even what, you said you would mm-hmm. do. And mm-hmm. that doesn't, you know, and in a way that's something that like, just like the object, I'm allowing myself some freedom that I don't, that I don't even really want, mm-hmm. uh, because it's not freedom. It's just impulse or something like that. You know what right. I mean? Like I got to yeah. stop it. You know, after a show it's midnight and we're at McDonald's and I'm getting a large combo or something. You know? like, <laughs> I don't feel better about that the same way with, right. but that, that object, like it is kind of in that way. Like, I wouldn't cheat, but I would maybe allow myself to do something that I don't mm-hmm. really want to do. The same way with my phone, I realized, man, I can just, I mean, I have to be so aware that I'm not just going, let me check this email at the dinner table. You know, with right. my kids, like we're sitting around and they're totally. all laughing and cutting up. And I'm like, I, I, maybe I even do need to respond to the email. Maybe it's a text right. that there's some immediacy to it, but I got to set those barriers to go, no, my my time with my family, my time with mm-hmm. my partner are so much more important than making sure, oh, I did get that Instagram photo in or something right, like that. Exactly. Or, you know, I yeah. got, and it's, it's interesting that the object has become now is becoming so much more important. Like it, it really is. Like, I, I wonder, mm-hmm. we, we're in such a new phase of having phones. You know, I, for most of my life, I, I didn't have a cell phone. And, <laughs> and, now, and now I haven't. We're, we're not, dating not, ourselves, by the yeah, way, Tony. 100%. <laughs> I, and I, you know, and I, I, well, I remember when cell phones first came out, I thought oh, this is probably not going to work. Who's going, who wants the phone? All that. Uh, you know, I like the one attached to the wall with the long cord. With the long uh, cord. Yeah. And, uh, and now I just can't even get rid of it. And so that is I something know. I think, cause I, I have a friend who was, we, uh, we've talked to a bunch and him and his spouse, uh, his spouse looks at their phone all the time, all the time. Like, and it's their way of like, um, relaxing after work, you know, you give yourself, mm-hmm. I, I, I work so hard today. 
I just got done with dinner. The kids are chilling. They're doing their thing. I just give me some me time. And I understand that, but the me time mm-hmm. it is in essence, if you're, if you gave a, another human that much of your time and touch and energy, of course you would think something's off. Of course yeah, you would go, wait exactly. a minute. I, I am not, I am really invested in right. this. This is right. wild. Yeah. And I think it's a good question to ask, like to say, like, if I were to ask my partner, do they feel more valued than whatever, insert your object, right? You're like more than my phone or more than, you know, from me hiking or for some people golf or whatever. Yeah. Or do they feel like I would put that before them? Because that's a, right. it's a fair question, right? And it doesn't mean you can't have your hobbies. Hopefully we all have our hobbies and our passions. And hopefully we have separate ones in our partner too, and, and some shared ones. But, you know, what's, if they were going to, if they were going to rate the, where they are, the value on your value ladder, where would they be? Yeah. And then I think, um, Also, we can touch on this too. If there is cheating, I guess, then the idea of forgiveness, because you said a decent amount of people stay together even. Like you you are able to forgive. I guess this Mm -hmm. recognizing the value in the relationship, recognizing that. Yeah, you know, that isn't right. I mean, that's a great and super tender thing to bring up. Thanks for for bringing that up. I think, you know, right. So, you know, obviously, (laughs) according to research, 30, 50, 20 to 50% of people will choose to cheat and uh, will cheat. Um, and then what do you do with it? And I, you know, I, I have clients ask me that specifically. And I always say like, I am not in your situation. I am not in your shoes. There is not a blanket yes or no to that. However, I, what I always say is what do you value? Like if you value honesty and you value transparency and you want yeah. the relationship to actually exist, it, it the, to me, the honesty is a really key piece because otherwise it's, it's unlevel footing, right? It is unsha- it's un it's shaky ground, right? Because it's not based there. You, it, there is something that happened that you're not disclosing, and to me, and I can this is my personal slant. I would feel very unloved because to, if you love me, give me the information, and then let me choose to stay or go, right? right? If right. you don't give me the information, then you've taken away my free will, mm. and to me, that's the opposite of love, right? That's yeah. that's like all sorts of repression. Again, that's my personal thing on it. I think it's you have to understand the situation, the setting, the temperature, your relationship. How much do you both value honesty? Um, I also know and have experienced personally and professionally couples that didn't disclose and still were able to repair and restore the relationship. So, you know, disclosing is sort of one thing, and then repairing and restoring is sort of its own its own its own animal. Um, you know, and I think again, each one's different. For me, there, I, I wasn't. I am. I was not capable to repair trust after that trust was broken. And that that's a me thing, right? That wasn't on my partner who who cheated. That was I am not capable of repairing. I don't choose to repair the trust. I don't want to live in a relationship where I can't trust you. That's yeah. that for me was a no. Well, that's right? so, so good I, that, that you recognize that. It's so yeah. good because because you you if you didn't recognize that, you could have stayed in the relationship and then. Hold on. That's the other component of it. If you don't recognize that and then you just stay in the relationship, but are resentful and, and oh, can't yeah. get past it, then that's it's, the relationship's doomed anyway. Exactly. And that's not, that's actually not fair to either of you. So it really, again, such an individual thing, but thinking about the disclosure as one thing, and then thinking about how are we going to repair and restore if that's what we choose to do is really its own, its own, its own journey. So, yeah. and, and one that's tender, I mean, there's no question that infidelity is going to cause pain and suffering whether it's disclosed or not. So, but we do things that cause pain and suffering. And so that's, you know, people make mistakes. And again, we are fighting our biology on this one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the big things we're talking about here is really recognizing you because like, just like you said at the beginning, when it comes to infidelity, it really is about you. It's not necessarily just the better boobs or butt or this person likes we'll go to sports with you instead and your, your spouse mm-hmm. won't. It's not really that it's something about you. And so I really do think, uh, I wish I'd have done this in my own marriage more, just taking an inventory of who I was. Cause you change so much, you know, so it, much. even if it's just subtle changes, I am not the person I was at 17, 27, 37, and now 47. I'm a different person. Totally. And, totally. uh, yeah. And so I need to take inventory. I'm like, Hey, what is it I want? In my current relationship, I really am doing that. And it, it feels really nice. Like I, I know that that was a mistake I made in, within my marriage of not taking an inventory enough, because honestly, I think just like you were saying that default monogamy and I was just default marriage too. like uh, mm-hmm. you just stay married. It, it's, right. it's not it's not going to end. And, you know, there's so many times I could I recognize like I wish I would have uh, 
because I'm such a talker and I feel silly sometimes that I didn't talk enough or communicate enough mm -hmm. with that and recognize that. And I think if, if you can do that, you should like you should take. Is there somebody at work that you're just actually really attracted to? And what does that mean? Is there, right, you know, exactly. it, are, are you looking at your phone too much? Like just mm -hmm. like, it, is it how important is it? Like if it was taken away from you for a month, how bad would you miss it? I, I would <laughs> right. I'd miss it really badly. <laughs> yeah, I, like I, like I, you, if you'd have withdrawals, yeah. like it might be. Yes. Something you look, and I, I believe we all would have tech withdrawals. You know? Right. One hundred percent. And that's that's kind of scary and a whole nother thing. That, that might be a topic we, we hit in the future as well, because mm -hmm. uh, that, that's pretty important. But, yeah, I think take an inventory of where you're at, who you are right now, what you want, and then sharing that with your partner is just a must. 100 percent yeah i think it was i think that's what Pearl says like if you're married in a long-term partnership you'll go through like five variations of yourself like you'll be married to five different people five different wow. yous five different thems you know and, and i love that like right because hopefully we're growing and evolving always and who who i was when i was 23 and newly married and who i am now as a 46 year old woman are then my essence is the same but pretty much everything else is different you know yeah 100 yeah, percent. all right this is great um I got two stump stormies for you today. Oh, to go okay. Along two. With this. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Hey. Uh, the first one. <laughs> see if you know this one. Men are most likely to cheat before what? What kind of event or uh, in, their, in their life or milestone in life? What What do you think it would be? Um, I have two thoughts that come up. One is either before, this is actually very tender, but maybe before having like a baby. Okay. Um, and then the other one would be before like turning 50. Yep. You nailed it. Uh, milestone birthdays, <laughs> uh, 30, 40, 50, 30, 40, or 50 men are more likely to cheat on their significant other others. And this is interesting too. When a man's age ends with nine, he is more likely to have an extramarital affair. Uh, <laughs> it says nine. Yeah, it says the same is true for women too, but the numbers are significantly lower. So those, yeah, I, th I think there's some kind of a, it, it's that in a way midlife crisis mentality of like, wait a minute, I, I've been with this person now for how long, right. and this is what it is, and it, this is right. for the rest of my life, and you start questioning exactly. It. Well, and back to the whole, it's more about you than it is about yeah. the other person. Like, right, you want to feel something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Second question, stump stormy. Uh, let's see how can I see if you can guess. What uh, there's a hormone that can prevent cheating. Do you know what that hormone is? <laughs> this, this is an intro. This is a really hard one. I, I the only thing I think of is like, gosh, like I'm thinking like what my mind goes is like chemical castration sort of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I'll let you off know. the hook on this. This is hard. It's actually a hormone called vasopressin, also known oh, as the cuddle hormone. Mm. Uh, it helps people form a bond and the stronger the bond, the less likely they are to cheat. Um, no, so yeah, the, the more you cuddle, the more you touch, uh, that connection is actually really important to your monogamy and fidelity. Totally. Vasopressin is one of our feel good hormones. It's a, it's a yummy one. It is, it yeah. is the cuddle. It is the cuddle hormone. Yep. Yeah. It's awesome. 100%. All right, good. You did great. I, I'd never heard of that <laughs> before. So that was a little, I know that was a little tough one. Um, all right. You want to do some listener questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's get to them. Um, all right. First one comes from smell you later. How do I tell my girlfriend her vagina does not smell very good? I love her and don't want to hurt her feelings, but it is a huge turnoff. Mm. Yeah. That one, when I read that, I was like, oh, that is so tender, right? Because it is, that is, again, we, we gotta just focus on not easy conversations on this podcast, yeah. but that's not an easy conversation, no, right? It is very likely that your woman is going to, that it's going to feel hard to hear, right? Imagine flip side, if you, if she told you that like, you you taste horrible or you smell yeah. horrible, right? Um, so I think the language that the timing, like should share what I do think you should share with her. Okay, first of all, because I'm always going to say communication, but how you share with her. So be connected, be tender, be gentle, right? I mean, I wouldn't say you smell horrible or I'm repulsed right. or anything like that. Those are very very hard terms. It's more bringing curiosity, right? So you might say like. I've noticed that there's a, there's a different smell that you have a different smell and use, use the terms that she uses for her genitals. And I'm, I just want to make sure that like health wise, you're okay. And, and I wanted to share with you and like, but I wanted you to know I'm so attracted to you and I'm so turned on. And this, I just wanted to bring this to your attention. Right. Very different than be like, uh, babe, you smell awful down there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So how you tell her, and then also that you are bringing curiosity and concern because the vagina smells 
differently depending on so many things, right? Our sleep, time of our cycle, uh, you know, our hormones, our diet, I mean, so many different things, our stress levels. So, but again, if, it, if you're noticing consistently that it's really intense, like if it's really fishy or it smells really like off, that might be a sign of infection and she might not even be aware. So you can yeah. kind of bring that state, that place of curiosity uh, to it. And, I, and what I was thinking of was as I, was, as I read that question, I was thinking of like the booger analogy. Like if I have a booger hanging on my nose, I would want my partner to tell me, right? Right. <laughs> and just the same thing. Like if something, maybe they have, maybe you have insight on her body that she isn't even aware of yet, but how you tell her the words you use your body language right of being leaning in versus leaning out those are really important things on this conversation yeah i think so i like what you said too there just like i'm noticing this like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like oh it's always been this way yeah yeah and i think the the nicer and kinder and loving you can do it obviously that's the that's the key don't just i think just blurting it out could be very insensitive and, right. Uh, it's funny. And not in the bedroom. Not right. in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it in the moment. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it's funny. Sometimes my girlfriend is shorter. So whenever we're hugging, her nose is like right by my armpit. So I just like, you got to go take a shower. So, you know, like sometimes totally. you can, if you can keep it lighthearted, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to, because uh, your partner wants to smell good. They, right. They're not trying to smell bad. Nobody intends right. to smell bad. So it's not their fault. They're trying to do the opposite. So just being, kind and generous with your words is just always the way to go. I agree. Right. And then maybe there's a simple fix. Maybe it's something like just, you know, just because for whatever reasons, all those reasons I listed and others, you know, the smell is more intense and, and maybe different. Like it's not, it's maybe it's less neutral than it normally is because of the vagina. It should be pretty neutral smelling. Right. Yeah. Um, but the, right. Then people say a little musky or a little, a little like of the sea, but not like fishy. Right. I mean, there's, there's different nuances of smell, but then maybe it's just as simple as like showering before intercourse, you know, yeah. maybe that like it's, maybe it's an easy fix. Yep. 100%. Um, all right. How, this comes from how many licks does it take to get to the center of a tootsie? <laughs> I can't come from a blow job. I'd like to, but it never happens. I enjoy blow jobs and my girlfriend is great at it. So is there something I can do? So again, the, the research would say it's very common. Okay. So just said nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is broken with you or your penis. Okay. <laughs> um, but that the research would say about 20% of men never uh, ejaculate from oral sex alone. Um, and, and then the other side, 30% of men always do, right? So 20% of men never do. And then you can see the in the middle is like, eh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So a couple of things, it, it, our brain, you hear me say this a lot, but our brain is one of our biggest sex organs, right? So mm -hmm. it is harder for men. It's easier for men to be up in their head during oral sex, right? And it might be like your mind wanders or you're thinking, oh my gosh, she's been down there long enough or is her jaw okay or whatever it right, might be, right. you know, <laughs> um, but takes you out of the experience and out of the pleasure, right? So the more you can do to just breathe and relax. And if you you said she enjoys it. So if she's enjoying it, let yourself enjoy it too. Like, right. So the mind mindset would be the one, one thing. The other thing I would say, it's a really great thing is you can use a lot of feedback. You know, often men will report that one of the reasons they don't ejaculate with oral sex alone is it's not enough friction and not enough pressure, right? Just the, the mouth alone. So maybe she can use her hands in addition, right? Yeah. Or But you got to give this feedback, right? And also, if you look at how men typically have self-pleasured or masturbated, it's, a, it's often like fast, furious, high friction, right? So this might not be sufficient enough to get you to your edge or over your edge. So it doesn't mean it's bad. It just might be not enough friction or pressure. So there's different ways, like use your hands. There's also like toys, right? There's like male yeah. vibes that can be used on the perineum or around to give that extra sensation that might put you over the edge, right? Yeah. So if you said you enjoy it and she enjoys it, keep enjoying it and explore, give a lot of feedback, bring in some toys, have her use her hands more, um, you know, and then also, you know, a lot of men will say they use oral sex as like a precursor to sex. And so maybe that's the case for you. But if you have a block, one good one kind of like little tip that I love is if you like really feel like the block is on ejaculation, um, you can literally have sex. And then at the very end, you can, if she's, if she, you know, if you have consent and you're open to this, then you can finish in her mouth, for yeah. example, so that you can be like, Oh my God, I did it. Right. If, the, if right. there's a block there for you. Yeah. So. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. I like what you said too. Definitely try other stuff. Use hands. Maybe you need to get the balls involved. Maybe the prostate mm -hmm. involved lube toys, exactly. try, try a bunch of different things because you're right. It could just be the pressure. It could just be you're in your head. 
Uh, yeah. So definitely try as much as you can. Uh, all right. Next question. Uh, this comes from money, 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 money. Ooh, money. <laughs> My wife and I recently had a conversation about OnlyFans and how much money people could make. And, you know, I guess they're talking about how much they could make. She said she would mm -hmm. be open to trying it if it made us a good amount of money. Uh, it would just be her solo. Could this be hurtful to our relationship or even uh, hurtful to our relationship or even to her, even if the money is good? Yeah, you know, I mean, OnlyFans is, again, a whole new, like, it didn't even exist. Well, and it really took off during COVID. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think a couple of things about that is one is like, you know, is it worth it? Because, yes, there is potential to make a lot of money, but you got to be in the kind of top percent of OnlyFans. And what are the chances that that would be the case? So is it worth the risk? Um, the other thing is to remember, like, that content's always out there. Like, that is that is out there. And depending on like what other role she plays in her life that may or may not be worth the risk. So those mm -hmm. are things to think about. I mean, OnlyFans actually like banned during COVID. I can't remember. I think it was like 20 end of 2021, but they banned sexual content and then they realized that they were going to lose all their money. So I think it was only like four days later, they reversed the ban, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but it is very much a lot about that, about that kind of content. So, and then as far as her and your relationship, that's really up to your relationship. So kind of funny, a, a great question on the tail end of our, of our podcast, because what are your agreements, right? Like, would this, would you feel as the, as the man in this partnership, that this feels like cheating, like a betrayal for her to have sexual content that other men are watching and maybe self-pleasuring to, right? And, and, and that's not, there's right. no right or wrong to that, but get curious about that, have that conversation with your wife. So really, really, really good communication about your agreements and what, what, how are you going to deal with jealousy if jealousy arises in you? That's another great conversation for all couples to have. Like what, how do I deal with jealousy? How are we going to deal with jealousy? Because Jealousy will come up in your relationship. And if your wife is on OnlyFans, it might come up even more for you. And that's okay. Jealousy is just a very common, normal emotion. It's just how are you going to deal with it? Yeah, 100%. I think the main thing there is, you're right, thinking about how this will impact the rest of your life and being totally prepared that it will live on the internet forever. Like it ever will, you know, I mean, <laughs> money comes and goes, but as long as you're comfortable with, Oh, it doesn't matter if I'm 67 and somebody goes, oh, I remember seeing you here, you know, or whatever, you know, what it, people make comments, people do things. Right. So grandma, just grandma was on OnlyFans. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, well, so, I actually saw something that they said, uh, one article I read was, it was actually really, it's really sad, but uh, a gal like her, like three, I think she said, two, I think it was three sons got expelled, got kicked out of a Christian school because she was on, the mom was on OnlyFans and I'm oh, like, oh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, just, I mean, we have so much stigma around sex and OnlyFans, you know, has a reputation of being very sexual. They, there's lots of other content on there, but being very sexual in nature. So you just got to like, you just got to know that and go in with like eyes wide open. Yep. 100%. Be prepared because there's so many peripheral things. It's not just, oh, do this, get money. I mean, then that's with any business, honestly. You right. know what I mean? Like when you're entrepreneurial, there are so many that, you know, like I know too, like when you're entrepreneurial, you do have some freedom and you are your boss, but man, does it come with a lot of peripheral things that you better take into consideration or else uh, you might Absolutely. just want to stay away. So just keep having that <laughs> conversation. All right. Yeah. This comes from these thoughts in my head. Um, I have a smaller penis. Somebody's going to clip that and start putting it on. They're gonna hear me say that. <laughs> Toby from memory and Sex 101 podcast admits to having a smaller break. No, I'm reading a listener question here. Give me a break. I'm not talking about me. Uh, my... <laughs> oh, uh, this person says they have a smaller penis. My wife never has said anything negative about me. And when we have sex, she says she enjoys it, but I always feel like I'm not enough. Um, I know you have talked about penis size not mattering, but how do I get past these thoughts of inadequacy? I think it's a really beautiful question, right? It's a really tender question. Um, you've heard me say before as a woman and as a sex coach that size does not matter nearly as much as men often think it does or report that it does. Um, but I hear the tenderness in the like inadequacy piece. So just kind of some statistics, okay, that if you ask men, this is an interesting thing, what they think the average length of the penis is in the United States, they will always say like six inches or more, six to seven inches is like the most common answer. And that's not accurate. Okay, so the, the on average, an erect penis in the United States is like anywhere from 5.1 to like 5.25 inches. Okay, so below six inches, right? So there's already a gap in how men think size matters and how it actually matters. Okay. Yeah. Um, but regardless of that, the, you know, your question about how to work through the inadequacy, just, you know, some tips is that 
you know, and you've heard me say like in a study that I like to quote, 77% of women reported that size does not matter. Okay. That size isn't even on their like list of like, I think it's the top seven criterion for great sex. Okay. But, and I hear, hear you reflect that, but you're feeling like your penis is inadequate. Right. So, you know, I think it's, it's a lot about, you know, do things that make you feel that your penis size doesn't matter as much. Okay. So maybe you're going to actually use less lube. This is one time I would say, maybe you're using less lube. Okay. Yeah. So that there, it's a less, that there's, there's more friction doing positions where slipping out is less likely to happen. So maybe legs together or, you know, some missionary with legs together with the woman's legs together or woman on top, right? Like the spooning position might, might not be your ideal position. You want to focus on deeper penetration if you're worried about the size of your penis. So, you know, getting creative positions, you know, trying different things like that. And then knowing that if you are enjoying sex and your partner's enjoying sex, like your penis is perfect, right? Like, and really telling yourself that yeah. having that, I, one area I've seen with working with my male clients is the, the, the really intense inner critic often comes up around their own penis, you know? So hearing that inner critic, that really critical voice that you might have about your penis and, and working with that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I think the idea here too, is you're having these negative thoughts in your head. You got to have positive thoughts in your head. It is, totally. you, you know what I mean? This is your body. This is what you have. And that isn't bad. I, 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 I struggle with a little bit of body dysmorphia. I'd always, have, uh, the person I see, I don't think other people see, and they tell me that. So I, I understand this deeply, but the idea here is when I am just going, you know what? I am enough. I'm, uh, I'm confident. I, I can be a great lover. I do look good. I can be handsome. I can accept mm -hmm. that compliment that somebody said I was handsome as true and not just them trying to be nice. You know, I think a lot of it, it really is. Once again, it's that brain of ours that just gets us into trouble because you are your biggest critic. And you can be a great mm -hmm. lover. I mean, the the G spot's right there. You know, you don't have to go that <laughs> far right to hit there. the G spot. <laughs> there's so many. There's so many uh, nerve endings at the front of the vagina. There's so. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is so much you can do. And you know, and just banging penetrative sex often doesn't lead to orgasm anyway. Right. You know, and right. so there's, and I, there's yeah. so much opportunity here. Totally. And porn really has negatively impacted men in that way. There's, you know, in many ways, but that way, because it's like they, you're going to compare yourself to that. Right. Right. And that is not real. As you've heard me say, porn is not real. Um, yeah. So many different ways, but you know, really like that's positive self-talk, but also getting curious. Like, why do you feel inadequate? Maybe you had a bad experience. Maybe someone said something, maybe it was just your experiences with porn, maybe whatever, who knows, but get curious about why you feel inadequate so that you can then move through that and start to feel like the powerful man and lover that you are. Yeah, 100%. All right. Well, thank you, folks, for sending in your questions. We love your questions. Mm -hmm. um, where can they send them their questions in, Stormy? So Stormy at lovedeeplab.com or, or Toby at marriagesupply.com and yep. send your questions. There is no question that we won't answer uh, anonymously yep. each episode. Uh, we love them. And then, you know, if you want to follow us along um, on our socials, uh, I am docstormy1, docstormy1 on Instagram and marriage supply is at the uh, at the dot marriage dot supply so at yep. the marriage supply on instagram we'd love to have you follow us along there and send in your questions yep 100 percent. okay we're gonna get out of here remember knowledge is power sex is power and the world needs more of both see y'all next time <laughs>